Good morning. So for this Dean of, uh, my name is Carrie Cooper, I'm Dean of University Libraries. Welcome to SWEM. So happy to see so many families in the library. I am a former teacher and school librarian before I was an before I became an academic librarian. So this makes me so happy to see so many kids in the library and to see a family event like this as part of homecoming. And we've been doing this now for 10 years. We took a break, of course, in 2020, like we all did. Um, but this has really become a nice tradition and a part of homecoming. And it was really the vision of Mary Mitchell, who was class of 1985. When I walked into this job, Mary Mitchell said to me, we have really fantastic people who are writing books um, and publishing um, awesome, awesome pieces of literature and children's books, and we should be celebrating them at homecoming, and the library has an opportunity to bring families into the building. And so she took me, you know, she gave me lots of advice. I was new and hungry for ideas, and so very suddenly she passed away, and this was kind of our way to remember her energy, um, her laughter, and and this became the Mary Mitchell Homecoming Breakfast and um, Author Series. And so we have lots of awesome people, right? We've had Tom Engelberger and CC Bell. We started, we kicked off things great in 2012, um, class of 92. Um, Anne Marie Pace, um, class of 87, and Sarah Lewis Holmes, class of 85, the next year. Um, Jennifer O'Connell, who is not an alum, but whose, um, whose mother lived here in our community. Um, came in um, 2014. 2015, we started. We decided we were gonna, um, we were going to honor adult books that year. Um, we had Forrest Pritchard, Barbara King, Susan Wise Bauer, and Catherine Erskine, um, class of 80, 94, and 96. Mary Quattlebaum was with us in 2016. Um, C.C. Bell, um, Catherine Erskine, and Sarah Lewis Holmes again in 2017. Anne Marie Pace and Alexandra Bracken in 2018, Carter Higgins in 2019, um, and last year we had P Padma Van Trenkeman, who had a master's in 94 and a PhD from our um, School of Marine Science in 01. And this year we are welcoming home Aaron Spencer, class of 2014. And so, um, I want to make sure that everybody knows I know it's a busy day and so I just wanted to go over what we're going to do today. We're going to have Erin um, speak. She is going to answer questions from the audience and from the children and we have, we have a little space down here. If any of the kids want to come sit closer, you certainly can do that. You can sit on the floor and then she's going to sign books. But I, I wanted everybody to, to, to know that if you're planning on going to the 1030 conversation with President Rowe, um, you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to get over there in time. Um, and for those of you that are wanting to stay behind and get your books signed, we'll be here until all the books are signed and you've had a chance to, to see Aaron and talk to Aaron. At this point, I am going to pass the floor to um, my colleague, um, Derek Aday. He is the Dean of the School of Marine Science um, over at VIMS. He joined us a year ago and he is really, he's got so much energy. He's such a great colleague. He's shaken things up. He's exploring how to bring marine science into our undergraduate programs, which we are very excited about. And he is going to do the formal introduction of Ms. Spencer. Derek, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, it's great to be here with you. I guess for the second year in a row, we are introducing a marine scientist as part of this event. So I guess SWIM has finally caught on. The marine science is where the action is. Um, so let me get out of the way so that the person that you want to see can come up. Let me just tell you a little bit about her. Erin Spencer is a marine ecologist and science writer who is passionate about sharing inspiring stories of marine conservation. She's a National Geographic explorer means that she's been able to travel from Florida to Fiji to learn how communities can work together to protect our oceans and our natural resources, everything that they provide. Erin's a 2014 graduate of William & Mary, and during her time here, she majored in ecology. She was a member of Kappa Kappa Gamma, Mortar Board, Development Ambassadors, and the Student Alumni Council. She has a master's degree from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I don't know if it means anything to people in this room, but if I was in the triangle, I would say that's the blue school. 
that shall not be named down the road from the red school that I came from most recently. <laughs> She's currently pursuing her PhD at Florida International University in Miami, where she studies the movement and behavior of great hammerhead sharks and the prey they depend upon. In 2014, Erin launched the Invasive Species Initiative, a website that uses digital storytelling to share grassroots approaches to invasive species management. The project aims to educate followers about the impacts of invasive species and provide people with tangible tools that they can use to combat invasives in their own communities. I'm sure you'll see in just a minute that Erin is very passionate about storytelling to bring attention to ocean conservation in communities around the world. As a former, former digital media manager and current freelance writer for Ocean Conservancy, she's written over 100 blog posts and dozens of wildlife fact sheets aimed at educating people about weird and wild ocean animals. Her photographs and videos of marine invasive species have been featured by NBC, The New York Times, National Geographic, PBS, and CBS Sunday Morning. And today she's here to talk about her new book, The World of Coral Reefs. So won't you please join me in welcoming Erin Spencer. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, was quite thorough. Um, I'm humbled to be here. I also, uh, I cannot start without acknowledging how special it is to be back here at Women Mary. Um, this is really the place that I hold most closely to my heart as far as kicking off this this really exciting and, and wonderful career that I've been building, um, thanks to the people in this room. And I won't get too far into it because it's gonna get me off track and make me all emotional, but I just wanna say thank you so much for coming here this morning and sharing this with me. Um, but let's get to the good stuff, right? Let's talk about, uh, we're gonna go a little bit into uh, my background, uh, talk about a little bit about the ocean research that we're doing, and then get into really cool animals that live on the coral reef. And I'm so excited to see so many kids with us this morning because I know all of you have ocean animals that you love, and hopefully you'll see a little bit of those today as we go through the PowerPoint. Um, so again, my name is Erin Spencer. Um, I am a marine ecologist, meaning that I study our ocean and the animals that live in it and how they interact with, their, with each other and with their environment. Um, it means that I get to spend a lot of time on and in the water, which is truly a delight of my job. Um, this picture was taken, this is in the Galapagos. It was very cold and we were doing some field work here. Um, and the hardest part about this field work is that uh, the sea lions kept messing with our equipment. Um, which is really one of those things that they don't prepare you for in class as to how to manage that when you're in the field. Um, but just to, a little bit, here's a little snapshot from my first field experience. Uh, this was at Wayman Mary. I did the summer course where they take undergrads to the field lab in Wachapree, Virginia. Um, and I got to make so many friends there. We, got, we were so muddy the whole time. And I think that's how I knew that maybe this field was for me because at the end of the day, when you reek of fish, and you're so tired, and you're covered in mud, and you're still like, that was such a great time. <laughs> that maybe this is the right field to go into. Um, so now I currently work on sharks. Um, I am a field biologist specializing in sharks, and by that I mean I actually go into the field to collect my data. There are so many ways to be a marine scientist. Uh, field biologist, I'm actually going out on the water, spending time on boats or on scuba to collect the data myself and with our team. Um, you can also, there's lots of people uh, that work in the lab setting, right, where, for example, we've got people in the lab that are doing shark genetics, where they're looking at shark fins and trying to look at the origin of fins and the shark fin trade, and they spend a lot of time in the lab. Um, they, we also have a lot of folks working. We got some marine biologists in my department that are like, uh, I get seasick and it's very hot out there and no thank you, I do not want to be in the field. And they work with massive data sets of fisheries data that's already been collected. Um, so I think if anyone here is interested in being a marine scientist, um, that's one thing to really keep in mind is that there are uh, so many different ways to be involved in marine science and you can pretty much take any skill or interest that you have and apply it to marine conservation. The way that I've chosen to do it is by going on and being a field biologist. Some days the job is pretty sweet. Um, some days you have beautiful, clean, clear skies and super calm waters. This was taken in Curacao where this is our field site at the end of this dock. 
So you just put on your dive gear, you walk out to the end of the dock, and you hop in, and you collect your data, and it's a pretty good day in the office, I would say. Um, but just like any job, I have to show up at the job whether uh, the conditions, whether I feel like it or not, pretty much. So some field days look more like this. Um, this was taken in Fiji, and it was a very, very small boat, and it was a three-hour journey between these two sites. And the conditions were so rough that we had to wedge ourselves in between the supplies and the side of the boat so we wouldn't go overboard. And then partway through this journey, the captain there stopped the boat to pray. Um, and I don't know if anyone has been in that situation, um, but it was definitely a story I didn't tell my mom for like years <laughs> after the fact. Um, so I do like to remind people that this is a job as much as those uh, spectacular days might seem like it's just a vacation. Um, but some days you really do have to go work to work regardless. So now I, as I said, I study sharks. I study great hammerhead sharks. Now, who raised your hand if you've heard of great hammerheads, right? Yeah, okay. Do you know why? What, what is it about great hammerheads that makes you know it's a great hammerhead? Yes. The hammer on its head, right. That's called a cephalofoil. It's that big, distinctive, beautiful head that's on great hammerhead sharks. And there's actually a number of different species of hammerhead. Great hammerheads are the largest ones. Um, and we're really lucky, I'm based down in Miami, we have a very large amount of great hammerhead sharks that come close to us in Miami Beach. So what I research now is I essentially put uh, Fitbits or an Apple Watch, if you know Fitbit or an Apple Watch, I put that on a great hammerhead, let it swim around, for a day or two, and then that pops off and we collect the data. So you can see me here, I've got this fancy little device that I'm putting on the dorsal fin of the great hammerhead. And uh, this fish, you can see my colleague is pushing the uh, body to the side a little bit so we can protect the cephalofoil, the great hammerhead's head, so they don't bump their head against the side of the boat. Um, and this animal will swim off, and then from that we can learn all sorts of cool things about how fast they're going and what are they hunting? What does that look like? And uh, how much energy that do they need to consume in order to, to sustain that sort of behavior? Things like that. Um, hammerheads really are just such a spectacular species. They are critically endangered. I know, that's so cool, right? And you can see this one actually has a snack coming out of its mouth right now. Um, but uh, working on, I could go into the, the science behind what we're doing, and I'm, I, I'm happy to do that. Listen, I, this is what I'm doing my dissertation on. I'll talk your ear off about it. But I really want to talk about just how um, being able to work alongside these incredible creatures gives such a deep appreciation and respect and understanding of our ocean, uh, and also how much our ocean is in trouble, right? So great hammerheads are critically endangered. They are one of many endangered species that we encounter in the ocean. Um, and it's not just about the species themselves, it's about the habitats that they depend on are also threatened, right? When we send this shark off to collect data, uh, the idea is that we're able to take all of this data and then directly apply it to the conservation of these animals. And that's one type of, that is one way that we're gonna be able to protect these animals in the long term. Collecting data, publishing data, trying to get policies implemented based on that data, right? But that's really only one part of it. There's so much more that needs to go into tackling these massive problems that face our ocean. And part of that is by getting everyone involved in ocean conservation and building that healthy respect and understanding and passion for our ocean so that we can make better decisions to help protect it in the long term. So to do that, <laughs> Part of what we need to do is bring the ocean to people, right? I am so, so fortunate that I get to be on and in the ocean for my job. But that's really pretty unusual. Um, it, I do think it is part of our responsibility as marine scientists to not only publish our data to be able to be used in scientific research, uh, but also to bring the stories of what we see firsthand to the broader community um, and make this accessible for everyone. Um, I'm really lucky that uh, some of my mentors here, including some people that are in the audience right now, um, have always really encouraged me to uh, do more than one thing, right? To combine a love for outreach and science together. Um, and so that's really what I've tried to do with this book. I've really tried to take my experiences being in the uh, coral reef and st studying the animals that I've been able to study 
and bring it to kids around the world, hopefully. So uh, I wrote this book, The World of Coral Reefs. It came out in March of this year. And really the idea behind this book was they were trying to do a non-fiction non book that targets uh, kids, especially around that elementary, early, middle school age, um, but that really was beautifully illustrated, but really had a lot of quite advanced scientific concepts. Um, one of the things that I've really noticed about talking to kids, um, like everyone in this room here, um, is that they know a lot more um, about the ocean than um, I think people give them credit for it. They're just sponges of information. And I think some of the hardest questions I've ever gotten in talks have been from kids asking me of like, how, how old is the oldest shark like in the history of the world? It's like, oh my God. I do get a lot of questions about dinosaurs typically when I do outreach talks as well. Um, I get a lot of questions of like, what is the deepest the, a shark could go, like the deepest deep sea shark. And I was like, let's Google that together. <laughs> um, but one thing in this book, we cover a lot of really cool scientific concepts. We talk about coral reefs, the biology and the ecology of the reefs. And we talk about how we can help conserve the coral reefs for the future. And I think that's a really important part as well. Um, the biology section, we go into some concepts that I actually have encountered in my college level marine ecology classes. We talk about symbiotic relationships, we talk about predator and prey dynamics, um, but all of that is really tied together with these really incredible illustrations, uh, which I can take absolutely no credit for. Uh, the illustrator, Alexandria Neonakis, truly brought these uh, images to life. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the goals of the book is that even if you don't wanna read a single word on the page, you can go through the book and just truly enjoy the beauty of the coral reefs and the animals that live there. Uh, but speaking of the animals that live there, I think I, wouldn't, I would be remiss if we went through this talk and didn't touch on some of the super cool animals that live in the coral reef. So um, I see some people have their books out and that's fantastic. Um, if you don't have your books out, I have a couple of snapshots that I wanna share with you. Um, we, as I said, we talk about the biology of coral, we talk about um, even like coral growth and reproduction and spawning. We talk about all of that stuff. But one of the coolest sections for me as a marine ecologist is looking at the relationship of animals that live on the reef. So coral reefs make up about 1% of the ocean floor but are home to about 25% of the marine biodiversity that we see in the ocean. So as you can see, that's super disproportionate. These areas are really small and they are home to so, so many animals. Um, here is just an example of some of the animals that we find on the reef. Um, can anyone here, does anyone recognize any of these animals? Yeah. Shark. A shark, right here. Yeah, we have a black tip reef shark. You can tell because it has little black tips on its fins. Yeah, right back here, what do you recognize? The turtle. The turtle, right, we have sea turtles. We have seven species of sea turtle in the world. Um, where I live in Florida, we see six of them. Yeah, what do you recognize? The fit, this fish? Where do you recognize this fish from? This one? Is it maybe from, from Finding Nemo? Is that the Dory fish? Yeah, yeah, we see a couple of Finding Nemo cameos in this book, yeah. The octopus, okay. So the octopus is my favorite animal in the entire ocean, it's my favorite animal. And um, not on this page, but, but within this book you see the blue ringed octopus, which is the most venomous octopus in the world but we won't go into that, that's for the book. Um, <laughs> um, anyone else? Yeah? Uh, the yeah, we have another little Finding Nemo cameo in here as well. We've got Gil, okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the specific animals. Um, so we, one of the pages talks about invertebrates that live on the reef. 97% uh, of the animals are, uh, on the planet are actually invertebrates. Um, I will have to take a side note and say I, uh, Professor John Allen, who is a William & Mary professor, um, I took his invertebrate biology class thinking I just needed it as a, it was a stepping stone to get to my biology, my ecology degree, but I was like, I like, I like fish, I like backbones, I'm not sure, and he made me, <laughs> he made me absolutely fall in love with invertebrates and started this lifelong love and passion for invertebrates. So shout out to uh, Professor John Allen. But one of my favorite types of invertebrates and one that we see on the reef is right here, 
and they're called nudibranchs. Nudibranchs. Um, they also are known as sea slugs, um, but as you can see, they don't really look like our, the slugs that we see on land, right? These are much more colorful, um, and they, I'm going to show you a couple of real-life nudibranchs that these illustrations are based on. So you can see the color of the nudibranch is truly spectacular. These little feathered um, appendages on their head are called rhinophores, um, and they help them sense chemical cues in the environment. Um, these animals are extremely brightly colored, many of them. And does anyone know why they might be brightly colored? Anyone in the audience can answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, right here, do you know why they might be brightly colored? Uh, because like, they it's a rainbow. It does kind of look like a rainbow. Yeah, no, I know, I love it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, okay, so great, they're poisonous. A lot of animals will be brightly colored to warn predators to stay away, right? And so there's plenty of nudibranchs that are toxic, um, and then there's some nudibranchs that pretend to be toxic, that they have the bright colors to say, maybe I'm toxic, and uh, get, get predators to stay away. Um, there's so many different species of nudibranch. There's 3,000 different species of nudibranch. Not all of them are so brightly colored, um, but you can see, but those aren't as fun to show on the PowerPoint. Um, but you can see these kind of appendages in the back. Um, these are actually, they look kind of feathers. Um, they're actually gills. And uh, the name nudibranch actually means naked gill. So the gills are actually outside their body and, and doing that. So this one I love too, because it looks kind of like a little bunny. Um, you can't even, couldn't even make this up if you tried. So we're going to move uh, into my favorite area, which is the fish. Um, and there are so many different species of fish that make their homes on the coral reef. Um, and there's lots of fish that are able to hide in the little nooks and crannies on the reef. It's a great place for juvenile fish, including some of the, the small fish that will grow up into the fish that we like to eat. They like to hide on the coral reefs as well. Um, so one of the fish uh, that we're going to talk about is the frogfish, which is one of the weirdest looking fish in the sea. Um, they actually have, you know, they're, they've got modified fins that look like little legs and kind of walk along the seafloor like a frog almost. And, but as you can see, their main skill is that they are masters of disguise. Um, the frogfish are able to, they, a lot of them look like their favorite habitat. So you can see this guy right here. No, it's okay. He is perfectly blended into this coral below him, right? You can see his mouth right here and his eyes. So a lot of times you could swim right by a frogfish and never know that he's even there. And although some species use camouflage to hide from predators, uh, frogfish use it to lie in wait for prey to come by, and then they snap them up. But they also have another method that they use. Oops, that they use. Um, you can see this one, the sargassum um, frogfish in the mangrove habitat. Beautiful, beautiful colors here. Um, they're actually part of the anglerfish family. And if you remember, if, going back to our Finding Nemo reference, if you remember the anglerfish, they have this dangling lure that's bright. If it lulls their prey in and makes it look like they, they, it hides the fact that there's a predator behind there, frogfish actually have that as well. They've got a little appendage that comes off their forehead and drifts along and looks like a tiny, tiny piece of food so that their prey will come really close and then by the time they realize it's not real food, it's too late. So frogfish are one of my favorite fish, not only because of their cool camouflage skills, but also because they just look so funny. I think this is, um, <laughs> I just find them so endearing. Um, so definitely uh, look up more frogfish when you get online um, with your parents back home uh, because there are so, so many cool species of frogfish. So this one I know a lot of people recognize. Um, here we have a hawksbill sea turtle. Um, the hawksbill is known for its beautifully patterned shell, that really classic kind of tortoise shell design. Um, and we're going to look at some real hawksbill turtles. One of the things that you notice about the hawksbill is that it has this very sharp beak. Um, and that's actually perfectly designed to go after their favorite food, which is sponges. Um, they love to go after sponges. They are... Uh, they will eat both plants and animals that are omnivorous. Um, but hawksbill sea turtles are, here's a, actually a close-up of their sharp, sharp beak. Um, they are endangered as well. Um, they are one of many species of sea turtle that is endangered. Um, and they also rely on a healthy reef ecosystem. Um, but the other thing we need to think about is this coral reef system doesn't 
live in a bubble, right? A healthy coral reef also depends on a broader healthy ocean. It depends on healthy seagrass beds. Um, it depends on healthy coastlines. Uh, so when we look at all of these incredible animals that we love about the reef, yes, they rely on a healthy reef to live, but they also rely on a healthy ocean. And all of us rely on a healthy ocean as well. Um, so we could go on all day with all the cool animals in the book. And if you want to come by and chat with me later, I'm happy to go through and share some of my other favorites in the book. Um, but I also want to point out a couple things, things that were really important to us as we were developing the book, is that this is uh, supposed to be a resource that can be used in classrooms as well. That's something that's very important as we were um, going along. So I actually also wrote a curriculum guide that fits with the, the science standards, the national science standards. Um, I am not an educator, um, and I just want to say that it took me, it took years off my life trying to figure out the science standards. Um, so shout out to all the educators in the audience that are uh, doing this every day. But I really, um, each one of this, um, each applicable part of the science standards actually has a corresponding spread that you can open the book to. There's questions around um, the science standard and as it relates to the book. Um, and then we also have another, a ton of additional resources online. So this is just one way to learn about the ocean. There are so many incredible online resources that are in the back of the book. Um, so for example, Google Earth has a way that you can go and do a 3D immersion in different coral reefs. Uh, we talk, for example, about some of the uh, problems facing the coral reef, including climate change causing coral bleaching. If you go onto this Google Earth program, you can see to the left what a healthy reef looks like, and to the right what a bleached reef looks like. And I think as much as the illustrations are truly magical, um, there's also something really incredible about pairing that with real life images um, that we can find online. So the hope is that this book is really just a launching off point or one step in the journey about learning about the or one step in the journey of learning about the ocean, um, and that there it's just the beginning of a lot more discovery and exploration. Well, this is just an example. If you're not in second grade, I actually have more than just the second grade. This is so be sure to. There's gonna there's a lot more online resources. Um, so I want to say uh, thank you, first of all, thank you so much for joining me today, um, and thank you for taking the time to, to learn more about the ocean. I know um, that a lot of people already have this deep, inherent love of our ocean, and it is so special to be able to share some of those experiences through this book. And I've also learned so much uh, taking this book to different libraries and classrooms and kids asking additional questions, um, making me really think. And uh, I just also submitted the manuscript for another book that's coming out in a couple years. I think I'm allowed to share that. Um, don't tell my publisher, but that's coming out um, about octopuses, so we're gonna dive even deeper into octopuses and all of the incredible species there. Um, so with that, I know we, it's a busy day. I just wanna say thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'll be here for a while, and we also have time for questions. Um, and then if you would like to continue chatting with me, please, please follow up. Um, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. We really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you to all of you who came out uh, this morning and joined us for this excellent talk from Aaron. Um, we're just so excited to have you here and to have all of you. Um, so, two quick things before we take questions. Um, if anyone has lost a hearing aid, there is one um, that we found, and it's at the check-in table. Um, so if you lost that, uh, you can find it there. Also just wanted to um, recognize that we have several of our library board members in the audience. Um, I saw Tracy Melton and uh, Gil Elson is, and his wife. They're here. Did they leave? Okay. Oh, are they back there? Okay. <laughs> and uh, Gary and Christy Berenger are here with us as well. Gary served on the board, so we're excited to, and also we have uh, Michael Rawlings, who served on the board, and, and Shannon Watson, yes. So I just wanted to recognize the, our board members for coming out today. Um, so now we are gonna take questions from the audience for Aaron. So does anyone have a question for Aaron? I'll bring the mic around. Any questions? Okay, we've got one up here. Um, 
one was supposed to be like the cheetah of the sea because I thought it was really fast. And I have a book about sharks. Oh, okay. The, the black tip, what, what was your question? Um, like the black tip shark. Yes. What's your question about it? I was thinking if it was supposed to be the fastest one. Oh, is the black tip, first of all, love that you have a book on sharks. I love that. I have so many books on sharks. Um, the black tip reef shark is not the fastest shark. Um, there are some sharks, I think the fastest shark, um, the mako shark is really fast. One of the things about the black tip reef shark is that because they live on the reef, they actually don't have to be quite as fast as some of the other sharks that live like in the big open ocean and have to do these like big bursts of speed. Um, great hammerheads are actually pretty fast. I'm a little biased, but they're actually pretty fast. But um, yeah, the black tip reef shark is a, is a super cool shark, and they um, do, do a lot of predation right on the reef. All right, we got a question here. Is there any sharks that um, are poisonous? Are there any sharks that are poisonous? No, um, I don't think so. There might be, there's one really small shark called the dwarf lantern shark that I think might, there's, you know what, maybe. <laughs> I can't think of the top of my head. There are, there's hundreds of different species of sharks. And although a lot of the ones that we think about are like the big guys, like tiger sharks and bull sharks and hammerheads, there are lots of smaller sharks as well. And there might, that's kind of ringing a bell. We can look at that up together after. Any other, any other questions? No? There's some, do we got some? Oh, great. What caused hammerheads to develop? The, the head shape that they have? Yeah, the question is, how did uh, hammerheads get that sepal foil, how they get that head shape? Um, so that was uh, evolutionary uh, development. It was, it's actually, in terms of evolutionary time, it wasn't that long ago. Um, but they, essentially, it was a mutation that developed this shape, and then it turns out it actually really helped them. Uh, so the hammerheads actually use their sepal foil to, like, pin down their prey. Okay, like, for example, they go after rays sometimes, and they can pin down their prey. But also, sharks have this special sense through these little pores called the ampullae of Lorenzini, and they allow them to sense chemical signals through the water, um, which means that even in murky water, when they can't see, they can still sense uh, chemical signals, or electromagnetic signals, sorry. And so hammerheads actually have even, because they have that big head, they have even more capacity for, for that sensory. So it makes them great predators. Yeah, the question, that's a great question and a really important one. What are some of the most effective nonprofits? Um, I think I, I need to uh, put out a, a statement already, which is I still work with Ocean Conservancy. Um, I, I believe them to be a very good organization, but there are a lot of really fantastic organizations. The things that I think you really need to look for, uh, Charity Navigator does a really good job. Uh, it's a website that kind of scales different nonprofits based on how they spend their money. Um, and then also, I really like to support like local groups that are doing ocean work. I think that there is a great space for big international work. But for example, where I live in Miami, like Miami Waterkeeper is doing like tons of hands-on work of like water quality in that area. Chesapeake Bay Foundation, if you, if you live up there as well. Um, so I always like to, to do a more like local regional level nonprofit. All right, we've got one up here. Do you know um, Dr. Eugenie Clark? I do know Dr. I mean, I don't know her. I know of her. And she is one of the coolest researchers. And she really, really paved the way for a lot of women in marine science. Yeah, she's super. Although I will say, I sometimes go out on a boat that's named after Dr. Clark. So we say, like, all right, we're doing research on the Jeannie Clark today, which is pretty cool. Um, so she has, there's a book, have you, there's, there's a book out about her, too, that just came out. I read a yeah, an adult book about her? Yeah, no, I think that's probably the same one I'm talking about. That's fantastic. Okay, next. <coughs> what is the fastest shark in the world? Um, the, I think the fastest shark in the world, I think it's the mako shark. Maybe it's the blue shark. Um, but they're, I know they're both really fast. I'm not sure which one is quite faster. But you can see by looking at their body shape, they're actually really streamlined. 
And you know, sharks have this really cool thing about their skin that make them super hydrodynamic in the water. So, you know, think if you're like petting a shark. If you go one direction, it's really, really smooth. And if you go the other direction, it's like sandpaper. And that actually means that as they're swimming through the water, it's like really smooth as they go by. I right. think, I'm not sure I explained that super great, but. <laughs> we have a question back here. What do turtles like to eat? What do turtles like to eat? That's so, such an interesting question. Different species of turtles like to eat different things. So for example, the Hawksbill sea turtle really likes to eat sponges, but the leatherback thing likes to eat more like jellies, right? They like jellyfish and the loggerhead will eat jellies as well. Um, the green sea turtle is one of the only sea turtles that will eat seagrass. They really like to eat grass. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, there's a, a, depending on the type of sea turtle, they like to eat different things. Yeah, thanks for your question. Okay, we've got one here. The, cr the creature that you said looked like a little bunny started with an N. You said there's- Nudibrank. Nudibrank. They, they have 3,000 species. How large are these? Um, the yeah. largest species will go to about a foot. Mostly they're really small. Mostly they're, they're really small. Any other questions? Well, thank you all. And of course, Erin will be around to sign books and answer any other questions that you have. Again, thank you for being here. And let's give Erin another round of applause. Thank you.